So, so, so what I'm saying is the story of the Bible is the story about how heaven and earth got ripped apart and that that was not God's will. That's something about that happened in the story that went wrong, right? So God, God wants to partner and rule his good world together with these dignified, image-bearing human beings. And as you, know, you saw in the funny scene right there, that, that goes wrong. Not because something was wrong in the way God set up the deal, it's because something went wrong inside of human beings, right? There's this, this urge, this urge to not trust God's definition of good and evil and, to, and to, to seize autonomy and independence and to define good and evil as I see fit and define it for, for ourselves. And here's what's crucially important, and this is a very simple way to think about communicating this, and why this story is wrong. If you look at the first sentence of the Bible, it says, in the beginning, God made heavens and... What does it not say? It doesn't say, in the beginning, God made heaven and earth and hell. God didn't make... Whatever hell is, God didn't make it. It's nowhere to be found on page one of your Bible, right? What God made is heaven and earth, and what does God think about it? It's very good. It's very good. So whatever hell is, it comes into the story later. And if you're familiar with the story, how it works, hell or evil or sin, the various names that it's called in the Bible, is something that humans have created by our decision to seize autonomy from God. Now, how do I know that hell is an appropriate word to talk about this? Jesus' brother Jesus' brother wrote a letter that's in, a, in your Bible, right? It's called the letter of James. It's very interesting. And Jesus' brother, who he hung out with Jesus a lot, I'm, I'm bound to trust the man when he says he's representing the teachings of Jesus. James talks about, the in chapter 3, he talks about the power of the, the tongue and how the human tongue has the power to, to bless and praise God, the creator. But at the same time, the human tongue has the ability to gossip about people and to tear down their character, and to speak ill and poorly of them. And James says this, it's flabbergasting. He says, when humans do that with their tongues, he says their tongues are lit on fire by hell. Are you with me? Now what are the implications of that? The implications that hell isn't just something about like the end of the game. Hell is a reality that is present now. It's a reality that humans unleash on each other and on God's good world to ruin and destroy relationships and to destroy people. Hell is something that we have created on earth. And God hates hell. And he, the story of the Bible is a story about God wanting to heal his world and get the hell out of earth. Are you with me? That's the story of the Bible. It's, God hates hell, because what it, hell is about the unleashing of selfishness and evil and the breakdown and the degrading of dignified, image-bearing human beings. That's what hell is. And just, it, it, the book of Genesis tells the story, Genesis chapters 3 through 11, known as the story of the, the fall, but that's what's happening. It's humans unleashing hell on earth, and God hates it because he loves his good world. And he loves human beings who are made in his image. That's what the story of the Bible is. And Jesus comes onto the scene announcing good news. The time has come. And heaven is here to invade earth and to confront evil. And just start reading through the Gospel of Mark. And what will you see Jesus doing? You will see him confronting hell and its disastrous effects on human beings. And it takes the form of him casting evil, personal spiritual evil uh, out of people. It, ha it has to do with Jesus confronting the breakdown of human relationships. Go, go to the Gospel of Matthew and listen to how Jesus talks about hell. And here's, here's the context in which Jesus mentions hell. Jesus hates hell, and he hates what hell does to human beings, and he hates where it leads human beings on a path. So Jesus so here's something we can all agree on, and Jesus would agree with us. We can all agree that the sexual abuse of children for money 
is wrong. And that it's, it's a plague, it's a hellfire plague on our world. We give it a more comfortable name called sex trafficking to like not think about what the reality is. We hate it, we want it gone from our world. God also hates sex trafficking. Jesus hates sex trafficking, but he actually, he actually takes it more seriously than we do. Because see, we want to get rid of sex trafficking. Jesus wants to get rid of lust from, from his world, right? He talks about the root, the root desire to use another human being for my personal gratification. Jesus is more serious than we are about evil in our world. See, we look out at our world and we, we see the ravage of racism and, and genocide that has resulted in recent history. We want that gone from our world. Jesus also wants that out of his world, but he's even more serious about it than we are, right? Because he doesn't want to just get rid of racism, right, and genocide. He wants to get rid of pride and contempt and rage from the human heart. Are you with me? So what are genocide and sex trafficking? They're raging hellfires destroying our world, but they're ignited by these small sparks of these deep-rooted distortions in the human heart and mind. Jesus wants to get the hell out of his world, and he wants to get the hell out of you. And that's good news. It's good news, is it? It's good news. But it's a double-edged sword, right? Because it's sort of like, okay, I want God to get evil out of this world, but I want him to do it without having to get rid of me, <laughs> right? You know what I'm saying? Like, that's the, this is the hard truth of Jesus. It's like, we've met the enemy, and he is. That's not the greatest news to hear, but yet at the same time, it is. It depends on who says it to you, right? If somebody is who's on intent on mowing you down with an M16 thinks you're the enemy, that's bad news. But if, if a surgeon, right, if a surgeon comes with a knife and he needs to cut you open to take out some life-threatening thing that's, that's poisoning your body, is that good news? Is it going to be painful? It's the story of the Bible. <laughs> it's the story of the Bible. Jesus is more serious about this than we are. And so how does, how does Jesus, the great physician, come to heal us and to get the hell out of us? He does it, it's, this, it's what Mark tells us. Just go finish reading the Gospel of Mark. Jesus lives this hell-free existence. He shows us what a human life is as God becomes human to actually be the kind of human that we are all made and called to be but perpetually fail to be. It's this hell-free life that only gives and that only loves, and that's only others-centered. And it's, act it's so offensive and so scandalous and so repulsive to those around Jesus and what he calls out of people and how he calls people out for their religious hypocrisy and their pride and their rage and their anger. It's, it's the paradox of the gospel, is that God so loves and is committed to his broken world ruined by the hell that we've made here, he actually allows the hell that we've created to overwhelm him and to destroy him, right? He, allow, he allows the hell that we've created to exhaust its power on him. And we call this the, this the moment of the cross. And the moment of the cross is the healing, it's the paradoxical death and resurrection of Jesus and the death and resurrection of our, of our world. Are you with me? In Jesus, the whole train wreck of human history and its consequences of evil and of sin exhaust its power in Jesus' death. But because this God is so in love with his world and with these, these compromised, fractured, image-bearing human beings, he will not let hell get the last word. And the resurrection of Jesus is this moment of new life it's a moment that speaks of God's love and eternal commitment to our good world. And the resurrection of Jesus is, represents this offer and this opportunity of life, of a hell-free existence in the present and on into the future. You guys with me here? Repent and believe the good news. God wants to get the hell out of you. And that's the best news, right? That's the best news you could imagine. And it's also hard news to hear. And so how does the story of the Bible end? You know, I had, I had that image there in the video of, of heaven and earth coming together, but what I didn't address was this. What's, where does this have to go? 
It's got to get out of here somehow. And so go look at the last page of the Bible. Where, where and what is hell on the last page of the Bible? Hell is God's monument, as C.S. Lewis says, to human dignity and choice. If someone refuses to be healed by the great physician, God will honor that decision. But what God will not do is allow hell to continue ruining his good world. And so the image that the last page of the Bible uses is of the great new garden city of heaven and earth married together again, and hell is outside the city. It's outside the city. God, it, it's God's mercy to contain human evil and to not to let it eternally ravage his good world and his good image-bearing humans. And for those who refuse to participate in God's recreation of heaven and earth, he honors that decision. They remain outside the city. Now that, there's all kinds of details that we want to know that the Bible does not give us about this. What it does is it tells us good news about the person of Jesus. It tells us that, that Jesus is so committed to getting the hell out of his world and out of you that he lived for you, that he died for you, and that he was raised for you. Turn to him and believe the good news. How you guys doing? This is, a, this is the story the Bible is telling. And it's at the same time a challenging story that will still be challenging and offensive and difficult to talk about, but I'm telling you, it's a, it's a compelling story. Because your friend who doesn't believe in Jesus also wants this. Are you with me? You, your neighbor wants the same thing that God wants. Are you with me? Right? Now that's going to involve a whole lot of conversation, but I thought, this is a compelling story. If we, can, if we can help ourselves understand it. And, and you, you will not be compelled to share this story personally unless you actually experiencing the loving, healing power of Jesus begin to remove the hell from you and to give you new, new life. 